Hey guys, and welcome back. This week we're gonna talk about faster than light travel. I mean, it's fundamental to almost all sci-fi games, movies, and books. I mean, it's needed if we want to circumvent the limit that is the speed of light. I mean, nobody wants to read, I mean, and some people out there do, a story about sitting on a spaceship for decade after decade after decade. And instead, we do that to things like warp drives and slip space as we obviously see in Halo. But what exactly is that? What capabilities could we mimic in the real world for fast and light travel? Are we permanently gonna be constrained by the speed of light? Well, talking about Halo, they call it slip space, AKA Shaw Fujikawa space. It's an extra dimensional domain in a space time consisting of 11 non-visible, infinitesimally small dimensions. These dimensions are like balled up paper. If you took a two dimensional plane, as you saw space time, and then crumpled it up, you're, you're kind of jumping from point to point through these extra domain spaces. That's how you can circumvent the limit of the speed of light because you yourself are not going faster than it. Instead, you're playing games by jumping point to point through space, but you yourself are going much slower. That helps you defeat things like relativity, you know, I don't have quite the time in this video to go at length. I would recommend Installation 00 actually has a fantastic video on this topic that you can actually go that explores the deep end physics. But just know that the faster you go, the slower you experience time, which is referred to as relativity. And obviously that creates significant problems if you're gonna be moving very close to the speed of light. There's actually a terrific book out, um, written actually a good bit ago called The Forever War that kind of talks about that problem of the first soldiers going to a far off war, moving close to the speed of light so that by the time they get there, so much time has passed outside of their travel because the faster they go and the slower it is they create ships with better engines and whatnot and it's just a total like mind bender about the consequences of relativity that said slip space in halo is not particularly safe and so while they're going through these extra domain spaces which don't have the laws of physics at least not as it appears in the regular kind of dimensions they use an envelope of self-contained normal space to kind of protect themselves it's a common thing theme in most sci-fi games or books is that those faster than light dimensions are dangerous. Things like Warhammer is obviously on the extreme end, as well as things like Event Horizon, which is a really great movie if you haven't seen it. But let's, let's you know, let's ground it. What about modern science? Like, what does that tell us about fast than light travel? Well, I, in my opinion, I think the authors and writers of Halo actually did a fantastic job of at least grounding and some credible sounding, you know, science. There's a lot we don't understand about the finer details of physics, you know, especially at the quantum level. Right now we use the standard model, which works for the vast, vast majority of things, but it doesn't explain gravity. That unfortunately will be encompassed in separate theories. So we don't have a unified kind of theory that encompasses everything. Instead, you have the standard model, which works especially at like more of a macro level. And then you start talking about the quantum mechanics at that very, very subatomic level that's entirely different and significantly more alien. It's very, very hard to comprehend. At least for me, I'm not a physics major. I do didn't even finish middle school. So all these proposed fast and light methods I'm gonna talk about though do rely on hypothesized exploitations of interactions put forth by some of these like newer theories of quantum mechanics. So let's talk about extra dimensions, right? It was introduced in Halo, so what does that mean? So we know that we have three that we can see and we experience the fourth space time in a linear fashion, right? We move through it kind of like one second after the other. String theory, both, you know, bosonic, super string, M theory, they give the number of extra dimensions anywhere from 10 to 26. These are kind of required mathematically to make the math work. The M theory, I think is like the newest one. It's a little bit more all encompassing. It corrects some of the errors that you see with some of the earlier ones and it gives the dimensions at 11. Now what that really means in layman's terms is that you have the three dimensions that we can see, the fourth we experience in space time. And these exist maybe in a higher like dimensional plane where the remaining seven dimensions exist, but we cannot see them. And that's due to something called compactification. Now, if you were to take a garden hose out onto your driveway and you laid it out flat and you walked far away it would look like a line but you know that if you got really close you would see that it, it isn't a line it has a linear length as well as circumference giving it another dimension and that's kind of the idea for these extra dimensions is that they're very infinitesimally small much like how slip space is defined in halo and it's really responsible for some of those extra kind of subatomic forces. It is almost not necessarily meaningless to us, but it's transparent to us. It doesn't really happen like matter. It's in the background. We 
just experienced the three dimensions uh, as well as fourth in space time. So let's tie it together. Slip space, as is defined in Halo, most likely impossible, but it cannot be ruled out. With good science, you know, unless you're able to disprove a hypothesis, you can't necessarily rule it out. We don't have a unified theory of physics yet, so we can't just say it doesn't exist. But most likely, according to most of the, you know, popular theories, at least like string theory, these extra dimensions, they're helpful in understanding and modeling subatomic forces, but that they're not like a dimension that we could exist in or traverse. But what it does mean is these extra dimensions and the forces that they allow could create or at least explain the existence of exotic matter that we could use for other additional fast and light methods. Things like matter with negative mass, dark energy, dark matter, what have you. The first kind of realistic design that could use these principles would be the Alcubierre drive. This is what you could you know, refer to as a warp drive. And it's, I would say, similar to things like light speed or what have you in uh, Star Wars, things like Star Trek. You're modifying the space around you per se. You are not jumping into an, an extra dimensional realm. And the way that it works is you're contracting space in front of you and you're expanding it behind you. Now, space time is not constrained to the speed of light. By my understanding, telescopes, when they look at the distant edges of our known universe, that space time is actually accelerating and it's moving faster than the speed of light as is. But space time is not constrained. And so you're kind of exploiting that fact by, like I said, you, con you contract space in front of you and you expand it behind you. You have a small bubble around you that is normal space time. And so you're able to kind of move very quickly, but you yourself, I mean, your velocity could just be zero. You're just static. And instead, the world around you, the universe around you is simply moving. The downsides there is you would still probably be influenced by gravity wells. Um, you know, if you go by a planet that may interfere with your drive's ability to move space time because gravity influences space time. Also, you probably don't want to interact with matter. I mean, if you hit a planet going in route, I have to imagine it's just going to kill you and probably do some really weird catastrophic stuff to said planet. Many of the mathematical evaluations for said drives suggests that the energy required would be immense. Some of the more recent studies have said that, okay, maybe you only need 700 kilograms of exotic matter, which is 700 kilograms more than we can make today. And that the energy released in this drive would just cook whatever was inside. And if it wasn't cooking you inside, when you come out of the, the warp, as you let space time return to normal, there's so much tension, right? Like you're contracting and expanding and you're kind of releasing all that force. Subatomic particles would jet out at extreme rates of speed. And it could be devastating, like if you happen to come out of a jump right next to a planet. Now you could get around that by maybe having like a high wake, low wake situation where you use like a slower rate to traverse outside of a solar system, where then you could do a max power warp all the way to your destination and the same thing. You come out of it before you hit like close to planets and then you slow roll it in much like you would if you were on a boat in the ocean. Another common suggestion to the Alcubierre drive is gonna be something like wormholes. It's my favorite because they're cool and they're also a lot simpler. You have different flavors that have been introduced over the years. Things like Schwarzschild wormholes, obviously the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which uh, Installation 00 talked about at length, and it's really cool. As well as, you know, my personal favorite is the Morris uh, Thorne theories. And that's because I love Kip Thorne. His, his books are awesome. He did a lot of the work for Interstellar, the Christopher Nolan movie. The book on said movie is fantastic, and it really explains some of those advanced stuff in a cool way. But this stuff, it, it does get really abstract. I'll try and keep it simple. If it's a topic you enjoy, I'd recommend, you know, looking at other YouTube videos only because I am neither an expert nor do I feel like doing 40 minutes to kind of break everything down. And I have to imagine most of you don't want to see that either. But jumping into it. So what is a wormhole? I mean, it's kind of like what we always expect. You take a piece of paper, you fold it in half, you punch a hole through it. And now it's like, hey, I'm going from two extremely distant points, but you're using kind of like the fourth space time dimension to bring them a lot closer. Now, things like black holes almost already do that. See, black holes stretch space time infinitesimally until it hits the singularity. And the idea with wormholes, you use something maybe like exotic matter, a sphere of it, to push against the borders of a worm or a black hole, and then you're kind of keeping it open. So instead of crimping itself off, and you have a stable corridor. Wormholes avoid all the problems with the Alcubierre drive, and it does this because you're not warping space-time, you don't have to avoid hitting planets and worrying about wake per se, but they do have their own issues, the separate ones, particularly when it comes to things like causality, time dilation, time travel. Now, that can be talked about at length. There's a lot to unpack there. But what I will say is that string theory in some ways, at least as proposed by Eric Amon and Harova, uh, two physicists, they argue that these higher dimensions of string theory, um, dimensions obviously 5 through 11, 
you know, attempting to break causality would cause them to effectively cut off these regions, uh, time-like curves. And the idea is like, and I guess in very common layman terms, is that if you're trying to use a wormhole and you're trying to play some tricks with it to mess with time so that you could travel backwards, doing so would make it unstable, forcing the wormhole to collapse. And then much like the Planck limit or the speed of light C, there exists like some constant, some, you know, background information that when string theory or just like maybe the, the subatomic forces are like self-healing. Stephen Hawking calls it the chronology protection conjecture. That these subatomic forces and, you know, behaviors, rules of physics would prevent you from doing anything that would violate causality. That when like, I wouldn't say detect it because it's not like a conscious thing on the other end, but that it would basically self-heal, that you wouldn't be able to do stuff like that. Okay, so that was a whole lot of science, just really dumping it on y'all, but how do we bring that back to Halo? Well, like I said, we want to go faster than the speed of light because we don't want to be sitting around forever. Alcubier drives make that possible, but they require significant energy, and you really have to have like an insanely refined root study. You gotta keep in mind, solar system, let's, let's take Alpha Centauri, four light years away. That means the imagery we see in our long range telescopes is four years old. So if you point your ship at it and you're like, hey, I'm gonna go there, and you jump, well, it's not gonna be there. It was there four years ago, God knows what's there currently. So instead, you have to take some very, very, very high fidelity models of basically your low close in solar systems to be able to generate the dimensional grids to get there to jump. You can get around that if you use wormholes. Wormholes, like I said, the rooting is very simple. You, you go in, you pop out. But unlike slip space and other forms of fast and light interstellar travel seen in sci-fi, it's going to be instantaneous. You go in and you appear on the other side. There's not even like a barrier necessarily to pass through. To, to the naked eye, it would look like a three-dimensional sphere with all sorts of crazy like gravitational lensing, but that you'd simply walk through. The exotic matter required mathematically to make these wormholes possible, well, theoretically, it does exist. So we could actually make this happen. The last note I have for fast and light travel, especially as we see it in Halo, is that its application is a bit interesting. They put the responsibility to go fast and light on the individual like spacecraft. You know, pelicans, condors, obviously they can join up with a larger fleet, but they have that capability. As far as I've seen, maybe it's in the expanded universe, they don't have static like gates that kind of handle that for you. But if you take a look at games such as Mass Effect and EVE Online, they use these gates to generate, you know, interstellar jumps. Or in this case, they could potentially hold an interstellar wormhole open for us and keep it stable. Imagine how much that would simplify things like freight and cargo hauling. You know, these companies, they're not going to want to be spending all this money to have a big, you know, energy hungry slip space drive. They just want you to keep it open for them so they can do sublight through it and then deorbit at their destination point. Planet. And you can imagine massive installations with stable wormholes that go all over the galaxy. And that could be like your hub for navigating. And I think you could, I mean, you could still have self-contained drives. It would just make sense maybe for it to be for like the military, but the vast majority of people that want to travel planet to planet could potentially do so privately using like publicly available um, wormholes. Overall though, physics, particularly quantum, is extremely confusing. I tried to keep this very basic, so hopefully it was, you know, well understood. If that's something you're interested in, like I said, there's so much content available on YouTube that can break it down because there really is so many more layers beyond the classic proton, neutrons, and electrons that were taught in school. These particles or even strings and the relationships are undergoing study, but what it's shown us hypothetically may give us the tools to beat the speed of light problem. Obviously though, we have so many decades to go before we can really understand to even how to do it, much less create the matter required to make it possible. But hopefully there will come a day where it will and we will take to the stars. The only caveat there is maybe, well maybe we don't want to. Maybe if we can't go faster than the speed of light, it's better off for us because it means that no one else would go out of the way to reach us. You know, like maybe a religious fanatic spacefaring race that wants to glass our cities. But in the meantime, I hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Everyone take care and be safe.